Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be chairing this panel. I, I bring the apologies of Chiao Mingde, who would like to have come from China but could not. Uh, so on your preliminary programs, you may have seen him on the, on the list. Uh, we're trying to adjust the uh, volume to make sure we don't uh, have feedback here. But this is, this is the panel on water and watershed protection in which we're going to look at, at three case studies and, and then have a chance uh, for each of the panelists to present their uh, presentations, respond to each other. So if, if someone has made a point the other thinks is particularly uh, important after we hear all three, we'll get feedback from them and then open it up for dialogue and discussion with all of you. And we are very fortunate to have with us um, uh, three very distinguished individuals. I'll uh, give their bios now and then let them each uh, begin accordingly. The first speaker will be Professor Jamie Benedictson. Uh, Jamie, uh, as you all know, has been involved with the founding of this academy from its earliest days and the organization of its secretariat at the University of Ottawa. He's a, a professor of environmental law. Uh, who lured me north to Ottawa on sustainable development law sometime in the 1970s. It was really a long time ago. Uh, he's published a wonderful book, The Culture of Flushing. And if you want to know why the toilets in this building use a vast amount of water to get rid of our waste uh, and throughout North America, uh, this is a good book to read. Uh, it's an extraordinarily fine uh, legal social uh, critique of the history of our solid waste management. That's human solid waste management and liquid waste management too. Um, following his presentation, uh, Ishtak Kornfeld uh, will be speaking on uh, the uh, damming rivers and the destruction of wetlands. He's the Giordano Fellow at the Faculty of Law at Hebrew University in Jerusalem where he concentrates on environmental law and in particular water law and coastal law. And we're fortunate to have him on this panel because prior to his legal career, he was a, a geologist who worked on a, a Bachelor of Science and Master's uh, degree uh, working towards his PhD. He studied law at Tel Aviv University and Tulane Law School and received an LLM with distinction from Georgetown and his doctorate from Hebrew University. And he currently advises Israel's Ministry of the Environment, uh, Rivers and Lakes Division. Uh, he's worked as an advisor on water issues to USAID uh, and to Congresswoman uh, Shelley Berkeley uh, of uh, Nevada, as well as as a geohydrologist for the US EPA and its water branch. Uh, and he also has uh, advised villagers in West Africa on water allocation issues and on drilling water wells working with an NGO. And then finally, we have um, Tina Corvella from the University of Helsinki um, uh, in Finland. Uh, she uh, was telling me that she did her uh, master's, uh, her undergraduate, her basic degree in environmental law, but then a master's on the problems of peat. And as we all know, there is enough peat in the world to constitute uh, as much greenhouse gas emissions as all that come from the United States or China today. It's a vast amount, and so the mining and depletion of this reservoir of greenhouse gases in the peat is not an inconsequential question. Uh, but she survived her master's to go on and continue with her PhD, so she's got some uh, uh, clear convictions. Uh, and she is doing her research on uh, agricultural, agri-environmental law. Her PhD is on the regulation of diffuse water pollution caused by industrial agriculture, uh, which she began her, her research on last year. And she will be speaking on the, the, the variations on a theme, ways to tackle diffuse water pollution on the basis of lessons learned. So we have a timekeeper, and each will have 20 minutes. Uh, and uh, uh, I guess I have a hook if they go over their 20 minutes, because we want to leave time for all of you to discuss. And I turn the podium over to Jamie Benedictson. Jamie. Um, I have been working on a book which is a case study uh, of a part of the world that um, is um, of great interest to me in uh, the border territory between um, Ontario, my 
uh, province of residence and the U.S. state of Minnesota. So this presentation is roughly um, uh, an attempt to crystallize or, or gather up uh, some of the uh, transboundary watershed management uh, issues that are associated with this, this particular corner uh, of the country. I'm going to start uh, in the present and drift backwards. Uh, my uh, objective is essentially to give you some indication of uh, how we got to where we are uh, at the present uh, and to illustrate essentially uh, the challenges that, that are now faced uh, in the context of uh, governing a watershed. Um, so I will start with the work of the very recent work of a body called the International Joint Commission. Um, it has a history over a hundred years. It has issued a report on governance, a word that is not found in any of its constituting documentation. Um, the report that I'm focusing on deals with the Lake of the Woods Rainy River watershed, um, a concept that is also not found in any of the legal documentation uh, constituting uh, transboundary uh, relations between Canada and the United States, but has nonetheless become an operational concept uh, in the work of uh, a number of agencies whose operations I'm going to uh, try to illustrate for you. If you look in the, uh, to you, uh, upper left little box, um, that is a, a picture roughly of uh, the center of, or parts of the center of the North American continent. And the region that I'm interested in uh, is on the boundary between Ontario and uh, Minnesota. It is illustrated in the larger picture. Uh, you'll see it is uh, a, a territory that begins slightly to the west of uh, the Great Lakes at what we in Canada call the height of land that separates uh, the Great Lakes St. Lawrence system from waterways flowing west and north. And my water system uh, crosses um, uh, moves downstream west to east and uh, east to west uh, and indeed uh, ultimately flows through uh, Manitoba waters and finds its way uh, north uh, to Hudson Bay. If you were to look at this uh, water system from a slightly different perspective, um, you would perhaps envisage it uh, from the point of view of uh, power generation potential as is, and, and volumes as is illustrated uh, here. The key lake uh, is the Lake of the Woods. Um, it has been the subject of uh, a number of inquiries which I'll mention. Uh, increasingly, we're interested in how that lake is connected uh, to its neighbors. The International Joint Commission only a few months ago um, it, it, it provided a report to the United States and Canadian government outlining a number of recommendations. Um, the International Watershed Board, whose history I will eventually mention to you, should be given an expanded uh, uh, mandate encompassing water quality. There should be a water quality study for something called a basin, uh, basin being another term absent uh, from the constituting documents uh, of the legal uh, boundary relations between Canada and the United States. Uh, there is a call for a watershed, uh, for a water level study uh, in the region, and there is a proposal for a summit uh, summit bringing together um, those who ought to be involved at, I'll just put it uh, in the abstract sense at this point, at the highest level uh, of making decisions about the future of the watershed. And this particular presentation um, will illustrate for you, I think, uh, the challenges of identifying who comes to the table uh, at the summit. There is further a call for a binational watershed management plan. 
Um, the notion, I think, that two nations should come together in a plan uh, that will uh, order the management of a watershed that they share, um, I think you'll recognize as, as uh, a comparatively unusual event um, in the world of sharing environments and natural resources. But that is now on the table as a proposal um, for uh, my watershed, the Lake of the Woods Rainy River System, as of a few months ago. How did we get to the point that in February of this year, uh, late January, early February, um, a report proposing these comparatively interesting things came to be? Um, my argument is that the driver, uh, the impetus for um, this result uh, rests in the hands of a group of citizens who constituted themselves not quite a decade ago as the Lake of the Woods uh, Water Sustainability Foundation, a private foundation, charitable organization um, whose essential function was to try to get people involved in this watershed uh, to get together in the same room on a regular basis. That organization, with the collaboration of uh, scientific advisors, researchers, and supporters, produced a State of the Basin report in 2009. This is a State of the Basin report produced by a private foundation. This is not a State of the Basin report produced by any governmental authority uh, that took on the task. This is ground up. Uh, uh, research and formulation of what effectively amounts to the problematique uh, for this watershed. Uh, the existence of that report and five years of effort um, uh, effectively, in uh, my analysis, shamed government officials uh, into speaking with each other in a more systematic fashion than they had before, um, and they agreed to constitute themselves as a multi-agency working group in 2009. Um, further, as a result of, of citizen lobbying of the most effective kind, um, individuals associated with the Lake of the Woods Water Sustainability Foundation persuaded the International Joint Commission, the binational Canada-US um, water uh, regulator, uh, to uh, initiate a task force and try to catch up because if uh, the governments were unable to catch up, I think there was some risk of further embarrassment as citizen, citizen groups simply moved ahead uh, independently um, with studies and reports and proposals on what should be done. The task force, when it got underway a, uh, a couple of years ago, had on its inventory of issues to think about uh, um, algal blooms, uh, shoreline erosion, aquatic in invasive species, fluctuating water levels because of uh, issues associated with um, uh, hydro uh, operation uh, on this system, um, and there are continuing uh, issues associated with, uh, um, uh, with uh, mining effluent uh, and other challenges of that kind. We transform this area uh, into an area that becomes the subject of legal interest uh, in a kind of comprehensive watershed basis over a long period of time, in this case, over a century. Within the last year, there have been fights about fish, fish that the Americans call walleye um, and that people on my side of the border uh, call pickerel. I can assure you that pickerel tastes much better than walleye. <laughs> This is a, a part of the country that was much in the news 30 years ago and sadly again this spring uh, because pulp and paper um, mercury effluent contamination produced in the heart of North America um, what you may be more familiar with as the uh, notion of Minamata disease. Um, the nerval, uh, nerve degeneration, um, especially concentrated in Aboriginal people um, who, um, uh, who live within this uh, uh, part of the, um, of the continent. 
Uh, again, sadly, over a 45-year uh, history, uh, this, uh, this part of uh, North America contains an area called the Experimental Lakes area, um, the only multi-lake long-term research facility of its kind uh, in the world, um, which um, my government two months ago proposed uh, to defund. Um, Prior to that, uh, the International Joint Commission had undertaken uh, isolated studies of Lake of the Woods, Rainy River issues associated with pollution uh, in the 1950s uh, with water level uh, regulation and management through the 30s. Um, and indeed, in 1912, 100 years behind us, uh, one of the very earliest uh, transboundary uh, joint inquiries, the Lake of the Woods reference, was initiated jointly by Canada and the United States um, into the question of regulating water levels on the Lake of the Woods. That inquiry and everything that the International Joint Commission does is undertaken within the general framework and the modest evolution of that framework established in 1909 uh, by agreement between uh, the United States and Great Britain, then representing Canada uh, in external affairs. And that document took the form of the Boundary Waters Treaty. That treaty deals with boundary waters. That is the source of authority for uh, everything that's gone on since. Um, and you'll note a particular attention to exclude the concept of tributary waters, um, without which we have some difficulty imagining basins and watersheds or hydrological units or the kind of concept uh, that increasingly uh, people are concerned about in terms of uh, managing the environmental well-being. Uh, of, uh, of the aquatic system and resource. The IJC had a modest mandate uh, to prevent and resolve disputes regarding water issues um, along the shared uh, boundary. Over time, the legal uh, framework established by the uh, Boundary Waters Treaty has been infused with scientific learning and understanding. Uh, concepts that, that were not uh, either understood, recognized, accepted, uh, and certainly not uh, integrated into the original uh, legal framework. Uh, the notion of ecosystem uh, management uh, emerged uh, prominently in uh, IJC deliberations uh, almost half a century ago. More recently, there have been discussions about basins. The interesting thing here is that both ecosystems and basins, uh, as the scientists envisage them, are much broader than boundary waters, meaning not including tributary waters. And indeed, the science has compelled uh, the International Joint Commission uh, to come to grips with the concept that a watershed includes land as well as water. Um, so there, there's been a kind of forcing back of attention away from uh, boundary waters, essentially a legal concept, a line running through uh, a body of water, um, to consider the well-being of those bodies of water in relation to the land use that has impacts. Uh, on those boundary waters, and you will immediately recognize including land use in the other guy's territory. So it is on that basis that it's now possible uh, in these isolated circumstances for Canada and the United States through uh, the impetus of the IJC to propose that there should be a joint plan for the management of activity in the watershed, meaning the two countries should talk about what happens on their own home turf, but they should engage in that conversation with each other. Um, this uh, uh, illustration uh, is uh, an, an indication, a schematic showing you the um, number of uh, boundary waters that are now constituted within 
the uh, International Joint Commission's watershed initiative launched in the late uh, 1990s. Um, and the Lake of the Woods rainy system that I'm interested in is the, uh, is the blue blotch uh, in the middle. But I show you the east coast to west coast uh, network so that you can see that the International Joint Commission is uh, encouraging right across the continent uh, uh, a conceptualization of, um, of watersheds in this transboundary context. There are all kinds of other uh, uh, international watershed initiatives underway. I've, I've listed them here. Uh, you'll see that there's modeling, there's statistical analysis, there's a data harmonization project uh, underway uh, and things of that kind. Um, I come then to the issue of um, what that January, February report might have envisaged when it said this is a report about governance of the Lake of the Woods Rainy River watershed. Uh, this, I can assure you, is a simplified uh, schematic of the various bodies, institutions, organizations, uh, agencies, groups, um, local governments, and so on, that are uh, plausibly, arguably uh, involved in some fashion or other uh, in bringing forward uh, either information or uh, um, political perspectives that are relevant to uh, how the water quality of the Lake of the Woods Rainy River watershed uh, should be managed and thus how activity in the basin including land uh, should be undertaken and thus how um, Canada and the United States as the two treaty parties should jointly plan uh, for the long-term uh, well-being of uh, the water in this system. I've, I've handed around, uh, I, I think most of you have got it, uh, a copy of this uh, schematic and on the back you'll see what is quite an abbreviated version of the list of intergovernmental uh, federal, national, state, provincial, uh, local government, aboriginal, NGO uh, organizations that are, that are players. What has the IJC proposed uh, then in the context of its watershed initiative um, that has given me a little bit of a framework within which uh, to work on my case study of what's been going on in the Lake of the Woods Rainy River system for, in the case of my research, over the past 150 years. Um, I think we are moving from uh, the triangle of a somewhat hierarchical uh, and, uh, and um, geometric understanding of who decides what and who's in charge uh, to uh, the more interconnected but less well-defined uh, approach to uh, decision-making in the Lake of the Woods. So we're moving from governing, as in there's a, uh, a hierarchical regime of rules that are driven from the top down, uh, Canada-US treaty <laughs> establishing rules which national governments uh, might uh, apply uh, through two states uh, or a state and a province that haven't, haven't got any connection to each other, um, to the situation in which the International Joint Commission um, is encouraging um, a, a, a much more uh, horizontal approach to decision making in which uh, uh, the national governments are partners with uh, the state of Minnesota and the province of Ontario and those two intermediary jurisdictions are in turn um, deeply engaged 
uh, in, uh, in discussions of involving the well-being of this watershed with their local governments, um, with NGOs, uh, and with uh, the traditional Aboriginal residents uh, of, this, uh, of this region. Um, I do not have an answer yet uh, about, uh, about how all of this uh, works. That's why I come to conferences like this where I, where I get to listen to Paul Martin. Um, uh, but my, ca my case study uh, is about uh, how we created the kind of problem uh, that needs to be solved if we're going to go forward systematically on a watershed basis. Thank you. Good afternoon, while I put up my, ah, there we go. Let me see where am I, ah, there I am, okay. Um, as it turns out, um, yesterday in the New York Times, there was a huge article about what's, what they titled the dam boom in the Amazon with regards to the Belo Monte Dam. Um, and this was actually taking place while some of you may have been at Rio plus 20. Um, so I think to, to some extent this is more timely than I, uh, I assumed. Now I will start my, um, my presentation with a few slides um, uh, and, and will basically lean on my geological background. So I want to start with uh, a picture of a river. This is in Arizona. Um, this is to me what I guess is an idyllic sort of river. Um, there aren't very many of these around anymore, so we might as well enjoy a few of them while we can. Uh, I want to start, though, with what I will call the geomorphologic life of a river. And that's how is a river born and how it ends, particularly uh, for my uh, presentation with regards to uh, dams. Okay. Now, the first... Uh, the life is given to a, a stream when it comes off a mountain, and it's called, in geology, that's called a braided stream. It's braided because it has very shallow channels. It just runs off. So you have these lines of water that just braid one over the other. Um, this is one in the Himalayas, and here's one in Alaska. Um, here are the braids, in any case. Now, as a river gets old, you can see that this may not be that great a picture, I'm not sure, but um, it braids, meaning it, uh, I'm sorry, it meanders. Um, and I'll show you some more meandering. Uh, and also, many rivers uh, eventually run to the sea. And um, here we have a picture of the Nile Delta, which is called a bird's foot delta, like the Mississippi River. Now, here, this is the Mississippi River, and in, in, um, in the prior millennium, a thousand years ago, this is what it looked like. Um, as the water was coming down, it would hit here, and point bars, or masses of land, would, would come uh, and form here. So as it's rushing, it hits here, the water slows down, and it has to in essence, dump what's called its suspended load in order to quicken up. Here, you can see in the 15th century, it's beginning to meander. Um, here, it's meandering in 19, 1831, meandering some more and causing, causing what are called oxbow lakes. And then it starts also with a uh, jumping of its channel, and here it's formed the Chafalaya River, and so on until we get to here. Now, river ecology, which I will talk about, has two facets. The first is what's happening in the channel, and the next is on the floodplain. Well, in the channel, we have hydrologic features, the flow of the water. We have water quality issues, fish, plankton, uh, macro invertebrates, and, and then we have the physical form of the river itself. 
And off to the, on the floodplain, we have birds, mammals, uh, amphibians and reptiles, microbes, and vegetation. Okay, so just, if you would keep that in mind as I go along, I think that might be of some help. Now, once we dam a river, we're basically killing it because we're controlling it. We don't let it run wild as it's supposed to. And this is from uh, Canada, the Old Man River Spillway in Alberta. Uh, here is the Hoover Dam on the Colorado, which was, I think, completed in 1931 or 32, and they literally moved the Colorado River through two sets of pipes that are, I believe, are four, the equivalent of four lanes of traffic each. And here it is at night, so you can see the bridge over it, and then you can see this is the forefront. This is after the dam, and, it, and it's going into what's called Lake Mead. Now, this is the Colorado River Basin, uh, and everywhere that there is a dam or lake, like Lake Powell here, um, Lake Mead, Lake Mojave, Lake Havasu, and so on, that's where there is a dam, and that's where the river is being controlled. Okay, now that's the end of my slides, so now I will um, go uh, naked, so to speak, without pictures. Um, mega dams, and, and by mega dams I mean dams that are uh, taller than 60 meters or approximately 200 feet tall, uh, which the Hoover Dam is, uh, and so are many others, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, have had a profound impact uh, upon the natural resources, uh, mostly of transboundary rivers, but of all kinds of rivers. And here I'm going to address a subject that I found is very uh, rarely explored in literature, the assessment and costs that dams have exacted upon the rivers and natural resources uh, which include fish, wetlands, and endangered species in my, uh, in my framework. I posit here, uh, and I hope that you will take, that we have some time for us to discuss this, that for all the good that dams have done, um, including providing low-priced hydropower and benefiting uh, irrigation, mega dams have been exceptionally destructive uh, to natural environments of rivers. In support of my arguments, I'm, I'm going to show you a, a few case studies uh, which will examine the effects uh, that dams have had on the ecology and natural resources of the geographic of each geographic locale or its river base or, or its basin. And I will close with, in a sense, a guess about why developing countries are now going uh, full force in using mega dams, having seen what they have done in developed countries. I, I'd like to start with the Colorado River and note that before it was dammed, um, it supported billions of clams, one species. Uh, and other life that since the 1930s has virtually disappeared. The, the dam, uh, as I mentioned, was completed in 1931 to 32. Um, because the dam and its irrigation projects like the Parker and Imperial dams have reduced the flow of nutrient-laden fresh water to the tidal flats where the river empties out into the Gulf of California. Researchers have found that where in the 1920s and 30s, there were 50 specimens of clams per square meter. For Americans, that would be uh, five per square foot. Today, there are only three per square meter, or three-tenths of a clam per square foot. Additionally, the inundation of large swaths of uh, geography by Lake Powell, Lake Mead, and other mega reservoirs drowned not only the portions of the Colorado, but also millions of trees, priceless gorges and canyons, uh, like the Glen Canyon, and segments of beautiful deserts unlike any other in the world. I uh, grew up in a desert, so I have a particularly affinity for deserts. Um, 
First of all, there's sans humidity, which to me is really great. Moreover, uh, human uh, intervention in the hydrologic base, uh, basin of the Colorado has eradicated water discharge and sediment supply to the river's mouth and its delta. Remember, like the, like the Nile, the, the rivers bring this sediment, what's called the sediment load, and it literally, in geology, it's called it's dumping its load. Because when it hits the sea, there's a chemical reaction. The ocean or the sea are salty and the fresh water, and there is this uh, mixture uh, of chemistry that absorbs the clays in, in, this, in, in the, the uh, river and pulls them, literally pulls them out. Okay. Now, uh, more, moreover, human intervention in the hydrologic basin uh, has, uh, after 95 years of applying strong flow controls um, to what there was a previous sediment budget, right? When the river flows, it has what's called a sediment budget. It's got all the sediment, and you can measure at different times how much there is in the water itself. Um, has been diminished to a trickle. These changes are ultimately responsible for the relocation of massive volumes of the Delta sediment inventory. Where are they going? Behind the dam. And they're not leaving. And for the serious ecological impact of habitat loss and of indigenous species, such as in the Gulf of, of California, uh, the now endangered Todoba, which is a relative of the sea bass, and the critically endangered Vaquita, a cetacean uh, which resembles a porpoise. All in all, while we may be rethinking in the developed world, um, for example, in the United States, dams are now coming down, um, much of that damage is permanent. Once you lose a species, you, you can't find it. Once the river itself is changed, yes, it will find a way, but it won't be the way it was and the ecology will, in turn, be altered, as will the, the watershed itself. Uh, like people, as I noted, streams have lives, um, and they have natural cycles, which the animals uh, that live in them, fish, insects, among other creatures, regulate themselves to. So when a dam is built, the flow of water behind the dam is artificial because it's being controlled. It's not going according, excuse me, according to, to the natural cycle. And um, therefore, the fish that have been acclimated to or are now in, in this ecological environment um, can't deal with it. Why? First of all, when a river runs uh, on its own, fresh, uh, it uh, flushes out stream bed gravel, flushes out the silt so that uh, in the gravel many species of fish and, ins and insects that n need clean well oxygen and need gravel for their eggs and larvae are harmed. Uh, second, nature's relatively constant water flow often leads to fairly constant water temperatures, which influences many species that depend on these natural fluctuations in temperatures. Um, one example is an adult uh, stonefly in the Flathead River of Montana, which do not emerge under natural uh, conditions unless the water temperature is 65 degrees Fahrenheit or, or warmer. Um, late summer discharges from the Hungry Horse Dam on that uh, Flathead River keep the water cooler than is natural, so whole generations of this insect never reach adulthood. Consequently, the fish which rely on it for food uh, are deprived of a source of food, and they too lose generations. Another common problem occurs when dams release water that is significantly colder or warmer than river water. Think of this. You have a 200-foot column of water in a dam. It's, at the bottom, it's going to be very cold. At the top, it will be hot, even in Arizona or in, in Egypt or wherever, wherever you want. Once you let the bottom water out, and that's what's going to go out first, 
the water is much colder. And it's too cold for natural cycles that, that fish and other living creatures can handle. So, for, uh, one example is the lower monumental lock and dam, um, which is what I would call a concrete behemoth, having seen it. Uh, up close on the Snake River in southeastern Washington. It renders the Columbia River too cold, some 20 degrees colder than is natural for most native organisms for a distance of 250 miles downstream. Not only uh, is water flow disrupted by dams, they also practically cut off the stream of sediment. When the current dissipates in the reservoir, it hits a wall and the wall is the dam, and the soil sits there until the dam is taken apart. That's not how it works in nature. Uh, so let me give you an example from the Colorado River. Studies there disclose that the Glen Canyon Dam captures 99.5% of the sediment rolling down the Colorado River. The sediment is penned behind the dam, and includes organic matter, which is vital for down t downriver food webs, sandbars that uh, are built where plants have have grown in and alongside the river, which are, and in their important uh, habitat for wildlife, constantly erode because they're not being fed. Um, so without the sediment with which to rebuild, they soon vanish, and the same holds true for the river banks. The absence of new sediment also causes riverbeds to lower and um, thereby destroying the riparian zone. Channels become deeper and the elevation of the river drops. The water table beneath the riparian area, which means groundwater, also drops. Therefore, there's no water to feed uh, the lush um, grasses, trees, and so on that would grow, and the, therefore another way that the, the river's uh, watershed is destroyed. Dams pose another challenge. They significantly alter the hydrologic cycle by causing ma massive evaporation of water. Uh, worldwide, close to 5,000 cubic kilometers, or 1.3 billion gallons of water, nearly 12% of the of the total annual river runoff are presently stored in large reservoirs. Almost 2,800 cubic meters of water were evaporated. In other words, more than 50% of the water that's kept. Okay, and that's every year, annually. Evaporation of pooled water, such as that found in dam-created reservoirs, is especially high in arid places. Uh, for example, in southwest U.S., in Egypt, um, in Iraq, in Syria, and in Turkey. If these riparians could harvest this water, rather than keep it in pools so the sun hits it, they wouldn't have any problems and they wouldn't even need to build dams. They could irrigate uh, their crops and they could probably find an alternative for hydroelectricity. Um, over 80 years following the launch of the era of the mega dams, as I noted, the developing countries are just heading forward into them without thinking. Um, and w while governments are doing this, and the World Bank funded this into the 90s until uh, the people screamed, and then it started a, a soon again, um, people are losing a sustainable way of life. Let me give you uh, a tragic example from uh, West Africa in the Senegal River. Um, which is semi-arid. The Senegal flows through Guinea, Mali, Mauritania, and, and, uh, and the country of Senegal. In March of 1972, there were huge floods, and the four countries decided that they would have to get together and dam up the river. They built two dams, the Manantali, which was completed in 1987, and the Diyama in 1986. The Manantali created a mega reservoir that holds over 11.3 billion cubic meters of water and is used for irrigation to produce hydropower and to control navigation. Uh, the Diyama uh, is built 27 kilometers upstream from the Atlantic Ocean 
and is used to stop saltwater intrusion flowing upstream during the dry season and in times of drought and also for navigation. The two dams began operation in 1988. And, in, and almost immediately, there was a uh, outbreak of waterborne diseases, one of which is schistosomiasis. That's pretty hard for me to say, OK? Um, I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's caused by a clam. And it is really, really very bad. It causes people to have diarrhea and to dehydrate. And then if they don't get proper medication or proper control, they die. Um, why is that? Once the river is dammed, whenever water is let loose or it rains, pools of, of water sit, uh, form and they just sit there. And this is a, the ideal environment for these clams, just as it is for uh, mosquitoes. Um, so this is not the only place. One minute. OK, I'm going to have to rush now. Um, similar infections uh, have been documented in populations living uh, in, in Egypt next to the Aswan Dam. Uh, and um, in, in Aswan, 100% of the population is always infected. Uh, in in uh, the areas around the Senegal, at least 60% are always infected. Okay. The increase in the diseases com uh, caused one commentator to say that the human health costs were greater than all the economic benefits of increased irrigation and na navigation potential put together. Um, I, I want to just talk about, and if Mr. Timekeeper will allow me, or with the chair's per permission, um, I'll just take literally uh, uh, a minute or a minute and a half. Um, when the people who lived on the Senegal uh, lived pre-dam, they had a sustainable uh, agricultural life. They would plant cereal grains, and then uh, they, they would move their livestock to other areas so they won't eat the cereal grains. And they were able to also trap and fish. And, um, and then once they cut the cereal grains, they'd bring the, the livestock back to eat the stubble from the grains. That can't happen anymore because the, they relied on the natural cycle of the river for that. So we have a lo complete loss of a sustainable way of life and an, an entire populations, different peoples who have suffered. Now, the, there are other, uh, I don't have time, but there are other venues where this is occurring. The Three Gorges Dam is one. Uh, the Gap or Southeastern Anatolia Project in, in uh, Turkey is another. Now, given all these uh, terrible ramifications and causes, why would developing countries even think about this? Well, I don't, I don't have a guess because I'm not going to tell you that I uh, even understand how politicians think. But here's a couple of theories. Uh, a professor who was formerly at the University of Chicago, Cass Sunstein, wrote a paper in 1983 called Endogenous Preferences Environmental Law. And in that paper, he talked about status quo bias. And he defined that by examples. For example, uh, he said that status quo bias, you can't predict it using models of rational choice. And he cited examples. People use one brand of toothpaste, and that's it. They don't like to change. Or uh, they, they think in one way, and they don't, won't listen to anything else. So what he, call, what he said was that changing has a high cost of transition. And it may be that the goods or ideas that people own or have, become, uh, or have become integrated into their lives, they don't want to lose because of the cost of transition. So a form of a, a relocation cost can take the, uh, the, the form of uh, guilt or psychological dissonance, and um, that is one possibility. The others are, we know that mega uh, dams are big business. A lot of concrete, a lot of contractors, 
and politicians um, you know, have a way of getting uh, into that system one way or the other. Um, there's also, there also may be the, the object of pride. The developed countries did it, we want to do it. Now, those are some theories. Uh, I don't have uh, answers, as I said. And one other possibility is the World Bank lends a lot of money for dams. And it, it has favorable terms. It'll say, we'll do one uh, A uh, if you'll do B. And maybe that's another uh, reason. Thank you very much for your indulgence and for allowing me to go over my time. It's plugged, that's the reason you can't see it. There's a mouse. Okay, good. Yeah. There you go. Thank you, thank you. Now it works. So, good afternoon, everybody. This is the last uh, session of today, and I'm, I'm the last presenter, so, so we might be all a bit tired. I try to keep you all awake. It's my main aim at this point. As I was presented, I'm Tina Korvela, coming from Helsinki, Finland. And I'm going to talk to you about uh, diffuse water pollution caused by industrial agriculture and the regulation we have in Finland on it. So, I'm the point of departure to my presentation. I'm not going to insult your intelligence and tell you all about the problems the, uh, industrial agriculture causes. You know it mainly. But uh, Finland is located at the northern Europe and is a long shoreline to Baltic Sea. And we also have a vast amount of agriculture. And it's said that we might be even the worst polluter to the Baltic Sea if it's calculated per capita. Even though even Russia has shoreline to Baltic Sea, still the amount of agriculture co conducted in Finland is a huge problem. Uh, the way the problem is caused is by phosphorus and nitro nitrogen loads and, well, depending on whose numbers you trust, the agriculture, agriculture is responsible of 50 to 70 percent of all nitro nitrogen runoffs to the sea. The percent percentages has risen in recent years mainly due to the improvement done in other sectors other fields of industry have, have uh, de developed their uh, wastewater management, as have the communities. So thus the lime, uh, agriculture has been put into the limelight. So as I'm going to present you the legal strategies we've used in Finland to tackle the problem, a few words about the basis of the legislation. It's mainly union-based which is implemented to Finland. Of course, we have some national peculiarities or additions we use. So, now we could start. The structure of my presentation is that at first I will guide you through the three phases of, of legal strategies we've had. And then I will present you two variations on those, which could be useful, which could be uh, doable in aim to protect our waters and sea. But of the three phases we've had, at first we've uh, aimed at the substance, the pollutive matter going to the waters and causing the trouble, trouble by this I mainly mean the nitrates directive, which dates back to the early 90s and has been implemented as later on also to Finland. The second step was using the carrot, targeted financial support, uh, funneled mainly via common agricultural policy or CAP. And the third phase is focusing on the area 
or an activities on it. This is quite similar as what Jamie told us about uh, watershed protection in the border of US and Canada. The Water Framework Directive given in, in early 2000 is uh, focusing on the river basins and the activities on them and not on some special substance or some special activity. And the variations I'm going to present include zooming in, going for small solutions for big, for big problems, and on the other hand, zooming out, taking a more theoretical approach to the problem. So, let's begin. Phase one is focusing on the substance. The NITRX directive, as I said, dates back to the 90s. And this means it was one of the first union, piece of union legislation focusing on water protection. And it has different tools with, it, with which it, it tries to tackle the problem. Uh, some of these are familiar from the later union legislation, but it might, might be good to remember that in the early, early 90s these were novelties and maybe for the first or one of the first times used in the nitrate directive. The directive has implemented a monitoring network, which means that uh, actions done and actions required are tried to be based on uh, updated scientific information. This is especially familiar later, later on in the double, uh, WFD or Water Framework Directive. NITREX Directive uses also action programs for member states. These mean, for example, uh, rules concerning the manure storage capacity or periods when fertilization is completely prohibited. And what is also familiar to NITREX Directive is clear implementation strategy or as I'd like to say, it clearer implementation strategy since it's not possibly that clear as it'd like to claim to be. But uh, in reality, this means that the member states have been able to point out nitrate vulnerable zones where fertilization is strictly limited or even prohibited. And Implementation strategy means also that the farmers are included to the implementation. And this is one of the most crucial, uh, crucial points in the nitrate directive. It means that there is not only a piece of legislation, but the actors on the field, or fields in this case, uh, are really included to the implementation. They are sort of different good practice manuals which are given and which can be followed. The nitrous directive is said to be effective, but it must be remembered that it's effective only at its scope. Uh, but it, the ground and surface water quality has been either stable or it has improved since the implementation of the directive. The latest numbers are from the 2008. But then again, main of the uh, many of the measure, measures and tools in the nitrate directive are, work on a voluntarily basis. So, and the directive in all focuses on one substance uh, and not in the activity or problem in general. So that's why the effectiveness of it is only partly or partial. So that's the reason to move on to the second phase, which would be using the carrot. By carrot, I mean targeted financial support for the farmers. As I said, it's mainly in, uh, implemented via common agricultural policy. We do have also some national support schemes, as does rest of the European countries. They are, uh, in other words, called uh, state aid programs. CAP has been under constant renovation since it has been going on. The latest renovation should be done by 2013, and the first legal proposals came last October. 
There are various options according to CAP how to funnel the benefits. There's direct support, agri-environmental support, natural handicap payments, and these are basically what they say to be. Direct support is support given to farmers regardless of their actions, as long as they farm, I think, but I don't know if that's either even a, a, a required. And then there is agri-environmental support, meaning that if farm, farmers adapt some environmentally friendly procedure, they get more benefits than the others. And natural handicap payments mean payments given to farmers in case of some natural, it doesn't have to be a disaster, a flood, drought, something like that is enough. Some not harm, harmful natural event. Living in this world, you would think that if you just put a decent amount of money into something, you get the best possible results. But unfortunately, the situation is not like that. I know that there are a lot of fields of industry which would be jealous if they knew the amounts of money used to farming and agriculture. But still, when it comes to environmental issues or water pollution, CAP is even in ineffective. Last year, 2011, a research was published in Finland saying that during the implementation of targeted financial support, the nitrate runoff has even increased. And uh, this, is, this has many reasons, of course. The agriculture is more effective and land use is more intense. But still, you'd think that the result would be other way around regarding the amount of money used. Of course, it's since the common agricultural policy is not about preventing pollution or being environmentally concerned, it has a lot of other aims and objectives it meets, meets while it works. But all this brings us to our third phase, focusing on the area and activities on it. Since the beginning, beginning of the millennium, there's been a new directive called Water Framework Directive. It was finally apl applied at 2000 after long negotiations. The focus in WFD, as it's called, is on river basins or watersheds, as you tend to call in this side of the Atlantic. And the aim is that all waters, are they surface waters or ground, ground waters in a certain ri ri uh, river area, should gain good status by the year 2015. Since we are already in the year 2012, it can be reasonably said that the aim can't be met. But the framework directive has uh, sequel deadlines going on, and it gives the opportunity to meet the target later on. Uh, there are many critical legal points in WFD. The first, and I think to my evaluation, the most crucial is the normativity of environmental objectives laid down in it. The WFD is built on the understanding of environmental objectives which must be reached, but are, the, are these objectives normative or not, is not that clearly put. Then there is again the feasibility of combined approach, which means that in the WFD emission limit values and then again environmental quality standards are combined and used together. And then there is thirdly the loveliest one of the, especially the Commission likes, the principle of cost recovery. Something that is quite common when we talk about ecosystem services, but what is now tried to be put also into the WFD, the scope of it. If the critical points are many, so are the uncertainties regarding the effectiveness of WFD. The first point is the normativity of it. Is it only a way to manage waters? to govern their use, 
and somehow monitor how they are and how, what should be done? Or is there some normativity in it? Does it require something more than just monitoring and governing? And then there are vast national ex exemptions in the directive, which are at currently at this stage quite in, in the dark yet. We don't know how they work or how big they are and what could be done with them. And thirdly, there's long implementation period the directive has. It was applied at 2000, but the first deadline is coming 2015, which is a long period of time. So, these are the three phases or legal strategies we've used when we've tried to tackle the problem of diffuse water pollution. And now I aim to present few variations on the theme. What could be done after, after all these three steps, the Baltic Sea is still one of, the, one of the seas in the world in really bad con condition. I start with the small solutions. And with this I mean that there has been some pro pr procedures which have been focusing on individual farms or even fields or parts of fields completely separately of everything else. In Finland we had a project called TEHO or EFFECT. It was uh, done between 2008 and 11, and it was uh, conducted in southwest, southwest Finland, where 20% of land's arable, uh, arable land of the nation is. The aim in EFFECT project was to find more effective measures to uh, aim to uh, diffuse water pollution caused by agriculture. But the lessons learned while it was on were that finding such a new measurements was rather challenging, even though the best forces in the land were in use. And even the old ones were not fully used. And this was because there was a lack of inf information in the, among the farmers. They didn't know that they could apply for agri-environmental support, or they didn't know what kind of support they could be entitled to. And this, on Saturday we were talking about the uh, Amazonian river and its uh, conservation schemes. And one of the problems there was that the local people didn't know that they were entitled to huge amounts of money just to protect the area around them. And I don't know, is it, is it can one say funnily enough, but in Finland, to be as developed country as it is, the problem is exactly the same. The people who are entitled to some support, they don't know they have that right. And, well, it's, it can sound as a small problem, but it's really real currently in Finland. But if we wanted to take the lessons we've learned from EFFECT project and apply it nationwide. The first problem would be that how we do it without adding bureaucracy. If the farmers and the government agree on some point, they agree on the fact that nobody wants more bureaucracy, they'd like things to work out with less, well, administration. And secondly, how about the principle of equity or equality? If farmers are uh, treated differently, regarding on different typological or geographical realities on their farms, can we still at the same time say that we comply to rules of rule of law or principles that we ought to treat farmers equally? Or is the status of the environment a good enough reason to forget this one? and treat them differently. Especially this last problem brings us to the second variation called legal ecology. It's a way of making ecological decisions by merging uh, challenges 
ecology has as a, field, as a field of science and these challenges are mainly caused by the fact that ecology is applied science and has some problems. It can't be used as a physics or chemistry just due to this fact. And secondly, the aim setting sections at modern environmental statues and thirdly, the values which motivate env environmental regulation. The model is built on the thinking of uh, Ronald Walking and Robert Alexi. And the key point is that the competing aims behind environmental regulation and especially that which realize when the decision must be made, they can be mended. They can't be mended in the abstract level and beforehand, but they can be mended at the concrete one decision level. And this one reminds me of a discussion we have on Saturday on ecosystem services and valuing of, of different ecosystem services. And there were some presentations we, which had, I think, even an aim of being that they wanted to be able to value different ecosystem services on abstract level. But if we take what uh, Robert Alexi has written seriously, we realize that the abstract values cannot be put together and can't be decided which one is stronger than the other. But in a concrete level, when a decision must be done, this can be done. And for example, in our case, when there is, for example, a freedom, freedom of occupation of farmers and then again pollution preve prevention on waters, they can't be solved in here and now, but they could be solved when one single farm would be taken under scrutiny. It sounds good on a, pa on a paper, but the challenges are, once again, that uh, legislation we have, nitrates directive, for example, that's not exactly a modern piece of environmental status. And then again, the WFD could be even called to be postmodern. In it, the aims and normativity are beautifully mingled, mingled that it's really difficult to say what it actually obliges member states or, or actors. And then again, if we, if we agree on that the competing aims can only be mended at the concrete one case level, how on earth that could be done without adding more bureaucracy, which we would like to avoid. So these were the legal strategies and some variations on it. I think in this panel I mainly have something similar with what Jamie was telling about the watershed protection and in that one, the Water Framework Directive might be some, give something new. Here's a list of literature for future references. But at this point, I'd just like to thank you for this opportunity and for your attention. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we've uh, developed several themes that cut across all three of the case studies, and I'd like to invite each of our panelists to comment on them. One is uh, that came out in several other panels today in, in this uh, colloquium is where is the governance uh, system? Where is the uh, process for this uh, to take place? Uh, we have a century or 150 years of developing in the uh, uh, question of the uh, river basin, the water, water basin for the Lake of the Woods and the Rainy River watershed. Uh, and we're still trying to figure out where is the governance. In the case of Finland, the European Union uh, creates an early directive in 91, but our understanding of the uh, nitrogen cycle and nitrogen loading ha in scientific terms has increased greatly. And the Baltic, of course, has got one of the oldest watershed, quote unquote, management systems with the Baltic treaties, and yet the Baltic is still uh, in uh, extreme conditions. And as uh, was pointed out, we still uh, believe we haven't seen a river that we shouldn't dam, although now Maine has taken down some of the dams. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to invite each of you to comment on whether you see insights that uh, are relevant out of these themes. Uh, and perhaps we go in the same order in which uh, uh, we began. So Jamie, any comments? 
Um, well, I was certainly uh, struck in, in um, all of the papers by governance issues, and you've focused on them. So where is governance in, the, in my Lake of the Woods Rainy River system? Um, the, everyone is interested in, in governance as a means of moving forward. I think there's, a, there's actually, Lake of the Woods is, is comparatively easy. We now have shared objectives, which are safeguarding the water system, and the challenge is how to do that. The governance trick um, is in finding legitimacy uh, for decisions, and the International Joint Commission is seeking its legitimacy for watershed governance, which is not in its mandate, in local communities and local involvement. So in fact, the IJC is thrilled to be pushed around by local level people saying, we want this. At that point, the IJC has a job and it goes to governments saying, we are pursuing the democratic local mandate. Nobody rocks the boat, and I think it, 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 it's moving forward. Um, I was uh, struck by uh, governance in, uh, in uh, Yitzhak's example um, because, uh, to some degree, the, um, the, the rivers that were his examples um, either in modern uh, developing uh, countries or historically the Colorado look like they are, look to some as though they are unoccupied uh, territory, as in we're simply taking advantage of a natural resource that is up for grabs um, and uh, totally delegitimate. Um, so governance lacks the credibility. Uh, it, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's difficult after your decisions have, have been made to, to, uh, uh, to account for them uh, effectively. In Tina's examples, um, and I, I don't know Finland at all, but I'm struck by uh, a kind of um, uh, the, the challenge of imagining that it, that it is a difficult thing to displace existing activity once our understanding of the impact of that activity comes to the fore. Um, as in, I think all this agricultural stuff is up and running. What are we doing? We're being happy yeoman farmers, uh, feeding our neighbors. We're the you know, fruit of the soil, all of that stuff. Um, time passes and we realize that the way we're doing this is profoundly harmful to our neighbors. And yet we're still caught up in a sense that just by being there, just by having done it for a long period of time, there's a kind of entrenched uh, okayness uh, about it. It's not okay anymore. Um, and, and, and we have that struggle. So where is, where is governance? I think goes back to things that people have been saying in different settings over the course of the day. I've heard it several times. Um, governance uh, is going to have to look different in, in different settings and different contexts. Thank you. That's very insightful. Here's Todd. Uh, I just want to pick up on, on what Jamie said um, at, at the end. Uh, from my perspective, governance is uh, something that is done by the powerful and not by the weak. Um, and, and we've been doing it the same way, what uh, I said before Cass Sunstein said, the status quo bias. We like the status quo and we're not going to change it, even if it's good. Um, the dams are a particularly bad example for governance because it ha the, the, you know, it's, it's a lot of money and governments want to do this. They, they're not interested in, in essence, and the best example of that is in India, of, of what the locals want. Um, with, with Jamie's example, um, 
You know, I, I think that the International Joint Commission, which uh, has been around since 1909, has had some fairly remarkable governance successes. For example, the Great Lakes Accords of 1972 and 78, um, they protected the Great Lakes and they were protected from pollution in 1978. The, the cycle sort of began in 1972 and there have been uh, what Jamie has called references um, that it doesn't work very, very perfectly, but I guess nothing does. One of the reasons that I don't think that the IJC works well um, is there are issues of sovereignty uh, involved. And this is particularly with the, uh, what is it, the Devil's, um, Devil's Lake? Devil's Lake uh, example, which I think is in North Dakota. Um, the United States doesn't want to do anything because it says, you know, we're sovereign and we're going to do what we're going to do. Um, that doesn't mean that, you know, Canada in some instances has had the same thing, but that's what's happening now. With Finland, I, I think that the, the whole agriculture sector is non-governable. Non you have, again, you have huge interests, and as Tina said, um, the, the farming is becoming more intensive, so you're bringing more animals to, to a locale uh, and trying to pen them together uh, to get as much as you can. Um, and, you know, it's the question of uh, how big is big? How much, how much bigger, Mr. Farmer, do you want to get? Um, and I don't think that the, that the European Union has, has been able to wrap itself around because of all these, what I would call parochial, but they're municipal. Uh, each country has its own interests. And the, the union can only do so much, so as, mu as can the commission or the parliament. Uh, and, and so I, I think that from a governance point of view, it's, it's just right now, it, it's just too, too uh, frayed, if you mm -hmm. will. When it comes to governance, it was indeed inter interesting to hear at first Jamie's presentation because I've been working with the WFD since I think 2007 or 8, and may been mainly frustrated since it seems that it's only a way of adding governance and having nothing with it. That's one of the reasons why I'd like to see that the directive has some normativity in it. Since if it doesn't, we have a bunch of measurements we do and activity we must conduct and it has nothing, nothing uh, that it could oblige anyone to. So in that sense, it was really a teaching lesson you gave that there can be a watershed with quite an amount of actors and you are still trying to find a way for them to work together. But then again, from Ichak, I, I kept on thinking about Professor Da Silva on Saturday when she talked about the Amazon River area. And I actually rem remember only one of her suggestions, which were that since the Brazil is starting those damming projects in the Amazon area, the only way to stop them is international pressure for meaning that if developing countries just pressure enough to de uh, or to developed countries pressure enough to developing countries could stop one of these huge projects but do you see the thing the same way or do you reckon that the amount of money the world bank is giving is enough to keep them going well uh, with regards to brazil for example i, I think that you know that they've planned uh, according to this uh, article that I saw in, in Sunday's New York Times, um, uh, about 400 more dams. So uh, it, it's tough to see how uh, people will be able to stop uh, a government from wanting to, to have so many projects. Um, you know, uh, the. Uh, this, but there are big protests um, in this, uh, in in that uh, venue, um, 
I think that the, the local Indians, the Aborigines, uh, are, are protesting as much as they can, and they said they're not going to allow the, the, the dam to be built. It's the sort of thing that Jamie pointed out to also. You needed a groundswell, local pressure. Um, I think on the international stage there could be embarrassment, but it's probably better to embarrass your own government from within um, and, and have it do something. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure, but uh, again, um, Turkey in, in its gap, south, southeastern Anatolia project, wants to build 22 hydroelectric plants, 19 dams, God knows how many other things. And some people have said that they, what they really want to do is um, remove the Kurds, and that's a very good way to do it. Now, you know, that might be true, it might not, but it's a, it's a certain observation. And really, who, who gets hurt at, at, at the end of these large projects? It, it's, it's mostly indigenous peoples or it's the poor. Uh, well, let's open it up to some dialogue with all of you. We, we've been grasping uh, for the norms underneath all of this. Uh, why do we want rivers to flow free or to keep their biological diversity? Uh, why do we want uh, the restoration of at least some stable aquatic conditions in the Baltic? Uh, why do we want uh, to understand what's happening to the uh, 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 Lake of the Woods and the Rainy River Basin? I mean, uh, what are we grasping at here that we are not able to seize? Because I think uh, uh, each is a work in progress, these case studies, uh, and, and they're not new. Uh, one of the things that really struck me is that the, the dams are physically uh, permanent, if you will, in a very big way. Uh, and once you create the management structure around it, uh, the people who run the dam have to make the dam work. So you've got a vested interest in doing that. Whereas it's not quite the same when we have to figure out how do we grow our crops and what are the methodologies, because that's an ongoing process. And then in the context of a large river basin, where we've built lots of little dams, as Jamie pointed out, we're create, trying to micromanage, if you will, or macromanage an entire huge basin, uh, perhaps beyond our understanding. So what do you all make of these things? Uh, what should we be doing out of these case studies on water management, or should we have some stronger norms? Yeah, please. There's a microphone here. Thank you. My name is Hella Anker. I'm from Copenhagen University, and thanks for very interesting uh, presentations. I'd like to just catch up a little bit on, on the discussion and the issue of the when governance can be put in place and relationship to the legitimacy. And I think the legitimacy is a core issue. Um, and also the, whether or not something is perceived as an environmental problem in society and in the political uh, circles. And perhaps I could illustrate with uh, Denmark as an example, uh, comparing it with uh, Finland. Uh, because in Denmark we have the same, we are under the same um, uh, regulatory framework within the EU the nitrates directive. And since uh, um, the late 80s and until now, the um, uh, nitrogen uh, the, um, load has been halved or more than halved in Denmark. So it is, seems to be the opposite yes. as in Finland. And since the uh, mid 80s, the environmental pollution from agriculture has been uh, criticized and has been recognized as a serious environmental problem. And that has created a regulatory um, scheme uh, under the nitrate directive and implementation in Denmark. And I can also say that that has also been the case in relation to the water framework directive. And presently, two agricultural organizations have sued the Ministry for Environment due to the implementation of the Water Framework Directive uh, in Denmark for being too stringent on agriculture. So I think it very much depends on the context and on the legitimacy whether we can have governance or address the environmental problems or not. Any uh, comment from anyone on the panel? Just that really interesting information, because the countries do share a, sh a 
shoreline with Baltic both, so and the situation can be that uh, different. So maybe there's hope also for Finland. <laughs> yes, David. Well, these were uh, really fascinating um, discussions, and they strike me as all examples of very complex systems, mm -hmm. um, and that uh, we and we are not approaching them from an adequate complex system perspective, uh, which means, among other things, we, we're not careful in where we draw the boundaries of what we are in analyzing. Um, and uh, to the extent we draw them far too narrowly, um, then we get piecemeal um, uh, ad hoc responses, uh, and we need to draw them more broadly uh, and, and I think so that the law has to has to be um, structured to be able to deal with the uh, full boundary of the system that you're dealing with. Now the dams, some of them are historic and there's nothing you can do about it, but um, obviously you could, in, in the context of the dams, the boundary is more than just the river, but it's also the um, Area, the economic benefits that will be um, accruing and the kind of development that will come from the hydro or whatever. I mean, you need to do uh, uh, analysis at that level uh, in order to actually get some handle on it. And in each case, and, and I guess the Denmark example um, emphasis or highlights this, it's really a question of community consensus. And that ultimately, um, since these are all sort of prisoner dilemma problems, uh, we need to get some level of cooperation. And there is no, um, until we get some cooperation, some agreement of what we want our rivers to be, we're just, you know, we're, it's going to be very, very difficult. Um, we don't want them to be commodified? Isn't that the modified, goal? Well, you know, <laughs> well, I guess commodified, if all the externalities are included uh, in the loss and all the lost ecosystem services are included in the calculation, uh, then maybe when you commodify it, well, now it's okay because all the values that uh, uh, we're seeking to protect and all the harms we're seeking to prevent get added into the price yeah. and uh, perhaps uh, in a heterogeneous world, we need, you know, really good pricing because uh, that's where decisions are really made. It might, might be good to go back to Jamie's first point, and that is that uh, community engagement forced the process, and real principle 10 uh, will allow people to force the process, uh, to allow uh, public participation and access to justice uh, to, to make it work. Uh, isn't, isn't another theme that ran implicit through this, the lack of, of real principle 10 for the indigenous people and the dams and, the, and the, the people who are victimized, if you will, displaced not just because they have no monetary value, as not reflected, but because there's no way for them to be part of the process. And, but uh, 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 yeah. I, would, I, would, I would just get, respond that if you look at the, the Red River Basin, um, which is North Dakota, it, you know, drains into Canada. Um, there's been plenty of public participation, and they have lots and lots of or, uh, government uh, organizations, none of which really uh, cooperate with the other, and they all have lots of public participation, and nothing gets done except very uh, narrow piecemeal fixes um, in response to specific flood problems. But, so it's not back really to Jamie's good. chart about governance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Other questions or comments uh, from all of you? We've got uh, people waiting to opine. Anyone else? Well, we reached the the uh, the hour which was anointed uh, at 4:40. I don't want to hold people beyond what they wish. But uh, I would like to thank this panel for a very uh, insightful set of papers. I've learned something, and I, I'm sure we all have. So many thanks to each of you for your time and participation. And thanks to our moderators. <laughs>